Good afternoon, Jordy. Oh, you finally caught up with the lectures to watch live again? Hey, glad to have you back. Glad to have you back. How are you guys doing this Monday? I'm a little tired. I don't know, man. It'd be dark so early now, I know. But at least it's been like sunny during the day. I'm really happy about that. That makes a big difference for me. If I can get some sun. But I hear you, it's getting, it gets dark, what, at like six? It's supposed to be 70 most of this week. Yeah, I don't know either, but I'm happy about that. I don't like that it gets dark at 5.30. I don't like it. this title really quick okay so today we want to talk about argand diagrams I'm not sure if that's how you say it Argand, Argand. It's um, it's a fancy name, but it's the concept isn't like super fancy. Let's go over here really quick. Yeah, like an Argand diagram is just plotting something in the complex plane. So when we're talking about the Argand diagram for flight modes, we're going to show how um, it's kind of, I would say it's a little different than the root locus because an Argand diagram isn't going to show the roots of the system. It's going to show, how do I say this? Okay, like, well, we'll, we'll unpack it with some math, but like, when you take a flight mode, that mode exists in the modal space. It's like an alien space. And then if we want to observe the mode in the physical space, we have to make this transformation back to physical space. From the alien space, we go back to physical space. And what's weird is when you go back into physical space, you're going to find that there's 
a real part of the mode and there's also an imaginary part but the only part that we see in reality is the real part but the imagine i don't know like it's hard for me to wrap my mind around because the imaginary part's like still there it's just that we don't see it I don't, I don't mean to talk too hippie about it. I mean, you, you can formulate your own opinion as we go. <laughs> but a mode in the physical space, it definitely has an imaginary part, but we only see the real. Maybe, yeah, kind of freaky. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, okay, you'll, you'll get to make your own opinion about it today. I... It's, it's a little weird. But the Argon diagram, it's going to show both the real and the imaginary parts. And I think it does give some insight into how these modes work. Um, and then I want to bring this into MATLAB because these, these diagrams are cooler when you animate them. So we'll try to do a little animation, try to get some insight here. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a little, it's a little weird. Okay. So let's, let's build up some momentum. So last class we showed how to uncover flight modes. Like where do they come from? Um, so here is where they come from. Let's talk about how to find them. So first what you do is you transform your model into modal coordinates. Like when we use Newton's laws to get a model for an aircraft, or it could be any physical system or electrical system, we do that modeling in physical coordinates. So you're going to have that model in physical coordinates. So Transform it into modal coordinates. And uh, to get that transformation, it relies on the eigenvectors of your A matrix in your model. You'll get to see that again in a little bit. Okay, so once you get into modal coordinates, what do you do? Well, simulate the response of what are called the modal states. Simulate the response of each modal state. These are the states in the freaky alien modal space, but I mean, really they are the most fundamental way of looking at the dynamics. So it's, it's, it's weird. Um, but that's what a mode is. It's it's one it's these modal states. So what does it mean for us in the physical world though? So you transform this modal response back into the physical space. to see what it looks like in real life. And I don't know why I put it in quotes, <laughs> but yeah, you'll see when we make this transformation back into the physical space, there's an imaginary part that comes with it, but we don't see it. We only see the real part. But it's there. I don't know what it means. Okay. When transforming these modal responses back into physical coordinates, we find... So this is typical to find this. Different flight modes... Involve... Involve some physical states more than others.
In other words, it, it might not use all of the parameters that you use to describe your physical model. I mean, so some modes might use two of your parameters. Some might use a different set of two. And I have some examples down below. But this is, this is where we want to go with this. This is one of the benefits of looking at things from a modal perspective that because modes generally participate, I mean, uh, depend on just a couple physical states, we can create reduced order models that only involve the most important states. So a reduced order model, like when we talk about longitudinal flight dynamics, we have a model for that that uses four states. But we, we made some reduced order models, right? One model we made for the fugoid mode, that only uses two states. Another model we made for the short period mode, that only uses two states. So we can actually break it into smaller models. Why do we want to break it into smaller models? It's easier to write con or, or to develop control systems for lower order models. So I guess, why would we want to reduce to make systems easier to control? Flight dynamics, in the end, it's a controls problem. And I think in the last couple weeks of this class, we're going to start to talk about control systems. All right. Normalization. So th this is just expanding a little bit more on this model reduction. So like I said, if you find a flight mode, it's probably just going to primarily involve a subset of some of your physical states. So like the fugoid mode, as I mentioned, um, it involves these two perturbation states, delta u and delta theta changes in longitudinal speed and your pitch angle. That's what the fugoid mainly depends on. Um, and the short period it mainly depends on delta W and delta Q, where delta Q is your a perturbation in your pitch rate. And this delta W, it's like a velocity in the downward body frame which is, um, this mainly translates to changes in your angle of attack. So, so these are just examples of how modes involve a subset. Okay. So yeah, we don't, we don't need to include all of our states to capture the general behavior of each mode. But this begs the question, okay? Like, how did they know which states to keep. When you say involved, do you mean they depend on those perturbation states? That's what I mean, Dilly. That's what I mean. Yeah, great question. So I'm saying like the fugoid mainly depends on these states. The short period mainly depends on these. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we'll try to make this clear because it's it's about to get trippy, okay? Okay, so um, yeah, today we're we're gonna talk about argand plots, and these uh, plots they're a tool to help us make this decision of if I want to make a reduced order model for a flight mode, which states do I keep in my model? Which states do I throw out? So let let's talk about these. And as a case study, we're going to look at the lateral flight dynamics. Because I still haven't given you... Uh, th there are some reduced order models for the lateral flight modes, which I haven't given you yet. So I want to kind of introduce the argand plots. And um, I, I think next class, I'll finally <laughs> show you what these models are. Okay, so... Um, okay. So we're going to, we're going to look at the 747. Okay. So for the lateral dynamics, 
we're going to have this model, a state space model, and this is in physical coordinates. This is, this is just your standard linear state space model. And last class, we converted these to modal coordinates. So we're just kind of taking the steps to uncover flight modes. You got to go into the modal space. So you have to do this transformation. You use this P matrix to bring us into a space where the dynamics depend on modal states. And this new matrix right here, we call A sub M. It's like your modal A matrix and it's, it's diagonal. So P, we call this our modal transformation matrix. It's composed column wise of the eigenvectors of A. So we'll say P is V1, V2, and let's, so th this is a fourth dimensional model, the lateral dynamics. So there's going to be four eigenvectors and you just stack them side by side like columns. And that's your, that's your transformation matrix. And we went into MATLAB and, and we got this P matrix, we got this modal A matrix, and I'm just going to give them down here. So to do that in MATLAB, you use the IG command. You give your original A matrix, which I called A747 lat. I use the IG command. That gives you your transformation matrix and your modal A matrix. And here I just pointed out that the first column is the first eigenvector. So that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at the eigenvectors stacked side by side. And then A modal is a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are your eigenvalues. All right. So the next thing I want to show you, you probably haven't seen this before. We're going to talk about how to solve a matrix differential equation. So um, once we're given our model in the modal space, you can get an analytical solution. What, what does analytical mean? It means uh, an equation that you can write down. Uh, which is different than a numerical solution. Numerical would be I simulate in MATLAB using ODE45 or like Euler forward or something, and it just kind of figures it out. The computer does it, but I don't have an actual equation. So This is, this is probably a terrible definition, but analytical solution, it's, it's like a solution you can write down on a piece of paper. So why do we want to do that? This is going to provide insight into how modes manifest themselves in physical coordinates or appear. So let's say we have our dynamics. Now it's transformed into the modal space. The solution is, so this is the analytical solution, and then we'll just kind of make it more detailed as we go. So here's the solution. Our, our modal states as a function of time, it's gonna be E to our modal matrix times T times our initial modal states. So these are our initial modal states at time zero. And then this, although you've seen the exponential before, I don't know if you guys have seen the matrix exponential.
which it, it is different than an exponential. Okay. So the solution of this differential equation, given the initial states, is the matrix exponential of our modal matrix times time operating on our initial states. Let's talk about the matrix exponential. It's defined as a infinite power series. Let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so here it is. E to the AM times T, it's our identity matrix. So because our system has four states, this would be a four by four identity matrix. And then your modal matrix times T, one over two factorial, your matrix squared times T squared, one over three factorial, AM cubed, and blah, blah, blah. It just it goes on that way forever. All right. Now this is interesting. AM, our A matrix in the modal space, it's diagonal. So it actually makes the, the matrix exponential much easier to calculate. So like consider the various powers of AM because we're gonna have like AM squared, AM cubed. Well, AM is, I'm just gonna do a fourth order one that's that's what we have here zero zero if you take the power of a diagonal matrix it's it's easy peasy it's just um you just square the diagonal elements and then the other elements off to the side of the diagonal remain zero If it wasn't diagonal, wow, it would be a, it would be a huge pain. Okay, so let's write out what the matrix exponential is. Why do I get these like ads now? Not cool, man. Okay. Just going to like make a big matrix here. So I'm going to use this definition here. So the first element of the diagonal, it's going to be one from the identity matrix. And then I'm going to add, you know, a M times T. And at this top left element, that's just Lambda one times T. And then when I add like the squared matrix, it'll be Lambda two squared T squared. And this just goes on and on. Um, infinitely. And then the, um, this would be zero, zero. What well, we're doing the four by four, zero, zero, zero. The next element down here, it's gonna be one plus lambda two T plus, oh wait, this should have been lambda one squared up here, I'm sorry. All of those terms will involve lambda one. But now that I have this two, two element it's going to involve lambda two zero zero and then we're going to get down to this element in the in the corner here and the four squared t squared blah 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 now 
each of these what about the what about the factorials excellent point <laughs> excellent point that's why I need you guys so this should be two two that should be two thank you very much okay this if you look at just a regular exponential that would be uh, the definition of just e to the scalar lambda 1 times t and this one is e to the lambda 2 times t and so on and so we if we have the matrix exponential of this um, modal a matrix I'm going to write the four by one, four by four one here. It's going to be diagonal and it's diagonal elements are going to be E to the different eigenvalues. And then all of the I off diagonal elements are zero. So it's just beautiful it's lovely and then now we're gonna have a more detailed expression for the homogeneous solution in the modal space because um, so this is the homogeneous solution Delta Z is the matrix exponential times the initial condition so let's just write that all um, kind of expanded So this is delta Z T. This is delta Z. This is just our initial modal states. And then T zero, 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 zero. Okay, so let's say I want to look at the dynamics of the first modal state in isolation. So in order to see that, it, you, have to, you have to define an initial condition that just excites that first modal state. So I think we talked about this a little bit last time, but you could define some scalar sigma as your initial condition. And then the other modes, you set them equal to zero. Then you would get your homogeneous solution to just be, if we look back at this matrix, I would get e to the lambda one t times whatever I set that initial condition to be, which is, is sigma. So I'd get e to the lambda 1t times sigma. And then these other guys would be 0. So, um, okay, so we, so we have that. That's the solution of that first mode in modal coordinates. But now we want to bring it back into physical. And here you will eventually see that we bring back some imaginary stuff with us. It sounds like an alien movie where you go into some alien space. And then when you come back to Earth, oh no, we brought we brought something with us. Oh dear. Okay, so we have our solution in the modal coordinates. And, and at this point, we have the analytical solution. We have an equation that says exactly what it is. We have our transformation matrix back to physical space. And then uh, we have our solution that's going to be in physical coordinates. Uh, 
Okay. So, okay. This P matrix, once again, just to remind you, it's our eigenvectors stacked side by side. That's all it is. And then let's substitute in this matrix that we just solved for. If we just did the first mode, it'll be sigma times E to the first eigenvalue times T. And then zero, zero, zero. All right. Now, when you multiply this out, um, you're going to only have elements of this first eigenvector that multiply with this. Um, elements of this eigenvector would multiply with this 0, 0, 0. So if, if you were to expand this out, you would get sigma times our first eigenvector e to the lambda 1 t. And for the other ones, 0 times v2 and, and so on. I mean, if we had more, if we were to excite more than one mode at once, then, you know, it would look something like this. But we specifically designed these initial conditions just to get that, that first mode. Okay, so this, this first term, this is the analytical solution for what this first mode is going to look like in the physical space. So now I want to make this more concrete. Let's use some numbers. Let's, let's plug in some numbers. So, um, we're going to use some actual numbers from the 747. Assuming that, um, well, what we're going to do to give more context, we're going to um, look at the Dutch roll mode. This corresponds to first modal state. It's our first modal state for how MATLAB did the eigenvector decomposition. Um, like maybe a different algorithm might have made it a second or third modal. It doesn't matter. Um, just for us, it happened to be the first one. So, so here we have, if we use this formula, sigma is out in front and it's equal to one. And then this is our first eigenvector. That's what that is. And then we have E to the lambda one times t. So it's just that same formula up above, but we're plugging in numbers from the 747. All right. Oh, and this e to a complex number we can rewrite this using what's called the Euler identity. 37T. And then in here we're gonna have cosine 0.9455T. And then within this bracket, we're gonna have plus the imaginary number I times sine 0.9455t. Okay. So this is called the Euler identity. It just allows us to write that complex exponential 
as an exponential times the sine and a cosine. All right, now this is where we're gonna see that transforming this modal response back into physical coordinates, it brings back something real and something imaginary. So I'm gonna write out each of these terms expanded out. So I've already done that. So delta V looks like this. This is the real part of delta V, or uh, you could think of it as the Dutch roll mode. I don't know if projected is the right word, but whatever component. Okay, this is the imaginary part. And then these other expressions are a little bit longer. So P is our roll rate. We have the real part of delta P. And then on the second line, I have the imaginary part. And, and the same thing for all of these. Delta V, delta P, delta R, and delta phi. And I guess uh, the only thing to be like said about these is that it's an oscillating, uh, a sinusoidally decaying solution for each of these states. And it's got a real part and an imaginary part. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Oops. So each perturbation variable has a real and imaginary part when we bring it back into physical coordinates. Now the motion of the aircraft in real life, like what we see, corresponds to only the real part of each variable, all right? But this leads to the idea of an Argand diagram. It's gonna be a plot of the real part and the imaginary part of each variable in the complex plane. So, you can create a plot at each slice in time showing the real and the imaginary part. And that's why it's good to animate these plots. Right, so next I just wanted to remind myself to go to MATLAB because I want to make this plot, I want to animate it, and, and we'll go from there. We'll go from there. So what we're going to do, we're going to plot the real and imaginary parts of these in the complex plane as a function of time. And uh, be careful. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to make it back with our sanity intact. We might not survive this. So you should be worried and you should definitely wear a mask and social distance as we make this journey. Okay. Standard stuff up here. The weight. This is the... Wait, I switched these labels. Okay. Inertia. Okay, this is how fast we're traveling, 774 feet per second. And we're assuming uh, we don't have any pitch angle. So we, we have a 747 just flying straight in the sky. All right, so let's just put a pause right here. Oh, I got to save this. In class 11, 9, 2020. Oh, I think my VPN timed out. My MATLAB is...
connected to you be? Oh, and then I gotta do like this duo thing. Man, duo's a pain. Okay, we should be okay now. Are you gonna run my code? Let's pause it, I don't know. It's just catching up. You can do it. Wait, it just sh it just closed my MATLAB. It was like forget you, man. Attitude. All right, we're back, we're back. Now it'll work, okay. So we got our modal A, we have our P matrix, we have our transformation matrix. All right, good, 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 good. What I wanna do, let's uncomment this. I kinda made some code in advance, but my first eigenvector is the first column of the P matrix. This is my first eigenvalue. And then um, this is my settling time for that first one. What you do, like settling time is minus four over the real part of the root. So I made a time vector that goes up until the settling time. Um, and then this is the solution of that mode projected back into um, physical coordinates. So this is the same formula, should be. Yeah, it's basically, it's just like this formula. I just broke it down row by row. Okay. So we got this. So this is my solution in physical coordinates. And remember, this has a real part and it has an imaginary part. Let's do... Okay, I wanna go back down here because I think I have some code in place to do like some animation. Okay, good. Actually, I'm going to copy this. No, no, no. I, I want this. I want this. So, okay, what I have here on these lines, this is a for loop. And within this loop, what I'm plotting is... Actually, I kind of want to... Re I want to reduce this. I want to do something special. Okay, get ready. We're gonna do something special here. We're gonna do a subplot and it's gonna be a two by two grid. And each subplot is gonna be the real part and the imaginary part plotted against each other for each component. All right, let's do... Okay, so subplot 222. Two, two. I'm gonna do this. Good. So 
subplot 223. If you haven't done these subplots before, two, the first two numbers tell like the size. So this is going to be a two by two. And our last one. Plot. I want to grab this. Throw it in here. I want to comment this. Hmm. Let's, no, let's not do that. I think if I run this right now, it'll look a little weird, but let's try it. I got an error. Oh, undefined variable t. Oh, that's because I think I called it t1. Oh, I think I have to do this. Uh oh, more errors. Wait, where did I? Oh, because I didn't run any of this stuff. We got to run this stuff. Okay, no errors. Okay, that's good. That's good. Now we should be able to run this. Now, th I expect this to look a little strange, but we can play around with it. Okay, so what's making this look weird is the limits of the axes are always changing. And that is the problem. We got to fix the limit of the axes. So what I need to do, I need to uncomment this. And after each of these subplots, I have to put this command. I know this is a little work, but it, I think it's going to pay off. It's going to make it look cool. And for each of these, I have to make custom limits. So this should be minus del V abs del V one. This takes the norm. So the when you plot this, let's go back here real quick. Let's plot this. Let's let's go back here really quick. Okay, so what we're doing, we're plotting each of these in the complex plane. It's got a real part, it's got an imaginary part. So let's talk about like delta v. We're going to plot delta v in this complex plane. And at the initial time, if I plot the real part versus the imaginary part, I don't know what I don't know what the real part's going to be. Maybe it'll be like some positive, and maybe the imaginary part will be some positive. So we won't plot those sides. What we'll, we'll plot just a vector in the space. And what's going to happen to this vector over time is, oops, these imaginary and real parts, they change in a way where this vector, it's actually going to rotate around and it's going to, it's going to shrink. The reason it's going to shrink is because the real and the imaginary parts are both decaying over time because of that exponential. So it's going to get shorter and shorter. And um, these cosines and sines 
are what's going to make this rotate around. So I want to make my plot, when I do this in MATLAB, I want to make the window big enough so that it always fits this vector as it rotates. And as it rotates, it's going to get like shorter and shorter. But I want to, the biggest it'll get is the norm of this vector at the beginning. Um, I hope that makes some sense. But so I'm making the, the axis limits the norm. If you use the abs command in MATLAB, That just that just takes the magnitude so for each of these they're each gonna have different magnitudes so I gotta um, maybe I should like separate these by spaces that'll make it a little more clear okay so this one's del P let's do that del P LP oh, I want um, this one's going to be the same thing but del R del R and then we're almost done we're almost done I think this is going to look cool that's why we're doing it there's a couple animations I want to make. Um, okay, so we got to get rid of this. Okay, let's try it again. Oh, ho, 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 ho. interesting, huh? So we have four argand plots. Each of them is showing the real and imaginary part. This top left one should be delta V. Real versus imaginary over time. And they're all shrinking in size. Okay, then I'm, I'm going to pause that. Um... What I want to do next, I want to take one of these and plot the eigenvector spinning around, but then I also want to plot the projection onto the real axis, and then I want to plot what the quantity looks like in the physical domain. All right, well, you'll see what I mean. All right, I'm going to copy. All right, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Let's focus in on one variable. We'll look at delta V. Um this time we're just going to make two plots and the one plot's just going to be that the real and imaginary components plotted against each other so this will be spinning around and then our second plot I'm going to show it's going to be time on the horizontal axis. And then I'm going to do del V. We're just going to show 1 to K. Del V, the real part. doesn't have to be all 
Um, okay, just bear with me. Bear with me. This will be cool. Zero to T end. I think that's fine. Do, 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 zero to real. Okay, I'm going to try this. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. I think I want to do zero here. And I want to make this like red. And I want to make this red. Okay, then we'll, I'll suppress all of this. Okay, let's think about this for a second. I'm going to be plotting the Argand plot. So this thing's going to be spinning around. And then on this, I think this will be the projection of the real part onto the real axis. And then at the same time, we're going to be plotting. As a function of time, how the real part is changing. OK, please work. I think this will this will be nice. So we have that thing spinning around in the imaginary and real space, but I'm taking the shadow of the real part and that magnitude I'm plotting over here. Okay, right, let's, let's do this one more time, but add axes labels. Okay, so X label is the real of delta V Y label is the imaginary part and then for this one, it's time and seconds, and Y label is the real part of delta V. Okay, I want to run this again. So this is what <laughs> makes me question like I don't know like the imaginary part of this thing like this real part this represents a lateral speed of an aircraft but as far as the Argand plot goes this is just the shadow of the vector of delta v on the real axis, which is reality. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're doing some hippie math today, so I just hope you're on board for that. Okay. We started this conversation today, though, uh, yes, talking about Argand plots, but we said this will help us to determine which states are important to which modes. So the way that they decide this is they look at the magnitude 
they take the argon plots of everything and they look at the magnitude of those vectors in the complex plane because they're actually all um, different sizes wait maybe I can show you I think the fastest way to show this is um, hold on I'll pull up the Nelson textbook. Let's see, actually. Yeah. Okay, so this is in chapter four. They actually use this hippie math, okay? So just just bear with me. Okay, th this is talking about the longitudinal modes. I know we were talking about lateral, but they apply these argand plots. Okay, here we go. Now you'll understand what this means, I think. Um, this is the argand plot that they made for the the long period mode which is also the the fugoid mode and there's different variables like um they're showing each of these all in one plot so we have the delta theta that's one of the terms this is its vector which just happens to be on the real axis right now but he's showing you with this arrow that this is rotating if you were to animate this over time and you also have this delta u like the change in speed now um there's let's look at this one this one's for the short period and so it has this angle of attack one it has delta theta again and, and these are like spinning around and they're telling you that the delta Q variable, which they multiplied by some other stuff to like normalize it, but delta Q is on this plot, but it's so short compared to these that it's not even visible. Um, and because it's so short compared to the others, they say, okay, that variable must not be important to describe this mode in the physical space and so I'm going to neglect it and in the same way there's two states here that aren't visible because they're so small compared to these ones like probably the the angle of attack variable is is here but its magnitude is so small that you can't see it um, so let's go back to the lateral um, and maybe I can show you this. I think I want to do this one. Is this going to work? Where is that thing? Okay, I think I need to run this. So what this plot is going to do, it's going to put all of these on. Oh, wait, I need to make a new one. Oh, you can see it. This is the Dutch roll, but I'm showing all four components at once. And, and all I want you to know is that each of these are different lengths. For the Dutch roll, they're all kind of similar lengths, though. Like, they're all kind of visible right now, for example. Like, I can see the purple, the blue, the red. Wait, let's see if we can start it over. So you see, like, the purple is way longer than the others at the beginning. And the yellow is barely visible. Yeah, you probably can't see this at all on your... 
phone or even your computer, this might be hard to see. <laughs> but yeah, if you put these argand plots all together, all four of our physical states, you see that each of them is kind of of different importance. Um, all of this stuff up here, it's just normalizing the variables in a way so that they're on, um, so that they're non-dimensional. I can see all of them, but the yellow one's harder to see. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I want to do this one again. This one I thought was pretty cool. And this is the Dutch roll mode once again. It's a different way of looking at dynamics. Um, if you guys find this topic interesting, uh, look into modal analysis because it's it's not just, this isn't something people just use for aircraft dynamics or um, this kind of stuff is applied to, um, oh gosh, I don't know. Like they use it in facial recognition um not not always dynamics it's it's kind of like the modal space has significance for lots of different problems and in general it uncovers a mathematically more fundamental way of looking at things it kind of like decouples um, and so I, like philosophically, I kind of, I f kind of find that interesting. I mean, you could even apply this in a way to language. I've thought about this a little bit before, you know, like when somebody's talking to you and they're trying to explain something, as you listen, you're trying to interpret the meaning of what they're actually saying. And the meaning is kind of a modal space in a way. Because the words themselves and the way they say it, like that's reality. And we're always trying to interpret the meaning behind the words that we say. But really that's something that's not in reality. It's like an abstraction. You could think of it as a modal space. So like, um, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of fascinating. Like right now, Siri and whatever uh, Alexa, they can do speech to words. Like I'll use that in class sometimes. Wait, is this thing on? Oh, this is this is weird. Do you see the text on the bottom of my screen? Sometimes there's like random words that pop up. So it's like someone else is using the feed. Yeah, okay. So we'll turn that off. But it, it, all that to show that like it's taking the <laughs> it's it's taking the words I say and interpreting it into um well, text, but like the next level would be like what you guys are doing is you're trying to interpret you're not just trying to hear the word, but you're trying to interpret meaning, which is like a, another layer of abstraction. So um, these modes, yeah, it only it only gets weirder, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> you can apply it to other problems. Um, so. That's what I wanted to cover today. 
I know this lecture was a little more out out there uh, but I I was <laughs> I spent a lot of time studying this and I tried to I was trying to connect it back to something more concrete and uh, I was having trouble this time I was like this lecture might totally crash and burn uh, okay, UB MAE student. Quick question about on the homework. On part D of problem one, it says compare the damping ratio and natural frequency of the fugoid and short period modes as in table 4.4 from Nelson. But table 4.4 does not have any comparison of damping ratio or natural frequency to anything. Interesting. Um, let's try to find table 4.4. So this one's taking... Right, it looks like this is looking at... Not the damping ratio and natural frequency. Wait, maybe maybe we meant to put a, another table. Sorry. Because I know there's a table that compares... Is it this one? No. Wait, I want to be able to scroll. Okay, so P is the period. T one half. Number of cycles to half amplitude, so that's... Kind of like a settling time. Okay, I think all we're going for is when you, this is talking about using a reduced order model and comparing it to the full model, right? I think what we're saying is just calculate the damping ratio and natural frequency for the full model also calculate it for the reduced order models and then just compare them and and see see how close they are i think that's the point yeah table 4.4 let me pull up the homework real quick let me let me just look at that question too Yeah, just ignore ignore that. If, but based on what I said, I think maybe I'll send an announcement to everybody. I mean, it's just just compare them. Yeah, ju yeah, ju <laughs> just compare them. Sick. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's that's the point. It's just it's kind of like what we did in um Actually, I think we did that same thing in class. I think we did that exact same thing for the Boeing. Hmm. 
<sighs> Alright guys I'll hang around for a couple more minutes If you have any Any other homework related questions or anything But that's what I wanted to do today Just take you on a On a trip Hopefully you found it Interesting If you didn't That's okay it was a little out there. I know that. Okay. Oh, even better. Also, the posted notes are like five sets behind. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I need to post those. Yeah, I got a little behind on those. see where yeah 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 I gotta, I gotta throw those up there <laughs> all right hold on how how far behind are we stability derivatives Okay, that's a couple behind. All oh, right, I got. What am I doing? Good grief! Let's get these up here. Let's get them up there. Yeah, I'm doing that right now. How are you guys feeling? You are you surviving this semester? This is the time of the semester where it's just like... Just feel tired, you know? Semester kind of slow. Oh, like the pace is slowing down a little bit? Workloads tend to vary greatly from week to week. Yeah. Is this week a... Uh, yeah. 16. Yeah, I need this. Feeling a bit overwhelmed every week, to be honest. Hey, that's all right. You are not the only one. You are not the only one, and that's okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the semester is tough. Even in usual situations. But at least you get more interaction with peers. And I think that's a reminder that everybody's kind of in it together. Struggling together, you know. And um, But with COVID, it's just like... 
everybody's in that same state of being somewhat overwhelmed, but then you don't get as much peer interaction. So you just feel, you feel more alone. It's faculty too, to be honest. But um, like I, I'm in a group chat with like Dr. Burge, Dr. Daryl, Jason, Armstrong, Ardashir. And it's, it's good to like go back and forth with them that they're, they all kind of feel the same way. It's like students, faculty in the same boat. It feels like, oh, it's tough. So we know all the students are like burnt out, man. I agree, the semester has e either laid back weeks or hell weeks. This week isn't too bad. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Strong group chat. It's a fun group chat. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really fun group to work with. That's one of the bummers of um, we, because usually we're we're all all our offices are right next to each other. I see people walking to in-person class, and I get jealous. Yeah, I know. I know. Hey, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it. Hey, have a good evening, Jordy. See you. Have a good night, Dilly. Thank you, guys. All right, everybody have a